Sid helped to develop the classification system of red and blue and yellow listing that we use here in BC to classify or categorize endangered species. And in fact, he published a paper describing this classification in a 1994 book that was edited by our own Lee Harding, who uh, is a longtime and very active member of the Burke Mountain Naturalists. So, but getting back to Sid, um, currently Sid is a species at risk biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service in Whitehorse in the Yukon, where he's beaming from tonight. And he's going to be telling us about BC's bumblebees. So welcome, Sid. I'm really, really glad that you could make it here tonight. Well, thank you, Victoria, for that uh, lovely welcome. And it's great to uh, be here virtually. I wish I would, could uh, be down uh, your folks' way, where it's warm and cozy, you know, <laughs> relatively speaking. No, I, I, I love it up here. I, I urge you all, as soon as you, we open the border to you folks again, uh, you can come up and visit. I'd be happy to see you up here. Uh, once we're all vaccinated, and we're all fortunately getting vaccinated perhaps before most of you, so we're very lucky up here. Anyways, that aside, uh, again, it's it's wonderful to be here. I, as uh, Victoria said, I got interested in species at risk a long time ago when I worked for the BC government in the 90s. Before that, I was uh, working at UBC uh, at the insect collection, and it was one of those jobs you sort of fall into. I didn't, I wasn't really an expert on insects, but uh, happened to be in the right place at the right time and became the curator of the collection there. And I. I kind of learned on the job and uh, I, I learned a lot about insects, but nothing about bees. I, I kind of thought at the time that bees were all, we all knew all about them, I guess, and I, I focused on other things. But uh, anyways, uh, uh, when I was up here, I, I, you know, I'm a species at risk biologist. And uh, as, as late you, you know, or most of you have heard that there are certain bees that are at risk, have declined. And uh, and back about, it was about exactly 10 years ago, maybe even 11 years ago now, 10 and a half, uh, our local member on Kasiwik, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, which your member, John Reynolds, is the chair of. Um, so we have lots of uh, distinguished members here. Uh, anyways, the committee was starting to look at bumblebees. And the, the Yukon representative came into my office and said, Sid, we got to start looking at bumblebees. You know, you got to figure, we got to figure out what's up here. And so that's what got me going on bumblebees. And uh, ever since then, I've, I've uh, looked at bumblebees, collected bumblebees, and, and uh, now I'm trying to figure out ways of monitoring bumblebees. And we can talk about that later in the talk. So anyways, that's where this all came from. And so I'm happy to give you a, a talk and I will start by sharing my screen. So bear with me for one second while you see my screen. I'll pick that and share. And then this gets in the way. How do you get there? Slideshow. It's live. There we go. Can everybody see that now? Sometimes it takes a couple of seconds to. Yes, we can see it. Okay, super. So um, I'm just going to move you guys just to the side a little bit. So bumblebees, big, bumbly, and beleaguered. Uh, uh, so bumblebees, of course, are a wonderful insects, and they are big. And so like butterflies or dragonflies, you know, they're very diurnal. They're out when it's, when it's sunny and warm. They're easy to watch, look to find. Um, later on, I'll tell you that they're a little bit more challenging to identify than you would hope. But uh, they're still a really good insect for everybody to start watching, just like birds or, uh, or uh, going out and looking at plants and things like that. And uh, so we can talk about that a little later too. And, and there are some of them that are at risk and that's the focus of much of this talk. So here's the outline. I'm just going to say a couple of words about what are bees, not going into great detail about what bees are and what are bumblebees in particular, just so we get it straight is what we're talking, because there is some confusion I've learned. And uh, a couple of little things about basic bumblebee biology so that we understand, you know, what their life is like. 
Oh, and it says Vancouver Island. I apologize. I copied this. I thought I got rid of all those things. This is a talk I gave, not this. It was like a, it started with a talk to Victoria. So some common bumblebees will say of the lower mainland. Uh, and then talk about bumblebees at risk for a, bun a bunch of the talk in the middle there. And then at the end, talk about citizen science, about iNaturalist, but I assume John Reynolds has hammered that into you. And, uh, and monitoring bumblebees, some more formal ways of monitoring bumblebees and, and seeing how they're doing and how you might be able to help. So let's get right into it. So what are bees? Bees basically in two words are vegetarian wasps. If you do the D DNA of bees and you do the family tree, the big phylogenies, um, you'll find that all bees, not just bumblebees and honeybees, but all the little families and families, thousands of species of, of uh, solitary bees, they all come out of one family of wasps called the crabronid wasps. So we have to fix up our wasp uh, family tree as well to, to uh, accommodate the bees, but uh, that's where they come from. They're just like birds or dinosaurs, bees or wasps. But all wasps eat insect or meat or something and they feed animal protein to their young to, to raise them up. And bees figured out long ago when they diverged about 130 million years ago, when flowering plants began to flourish all around them, they discovered that pollen is a very good source of protein. And so they switched to hunting pollen and provisioning their, their babies with pollen rather than with caterpillars or spiders or, or old tuna from your picnic. You know, so uh, that's what bees are. Bees are vegetarian wasps. And there's more than 430 species. There's probably more than 500. There's 430 we know right now. But most of them look like these little guys around the edge here. Solitary bees, you know, that dig little holes in sand or nest in hollow twigs. But if each female has her own nest and they and she lays her own eggs and then provisions those eggs with pollen and uh, the young uh, grow up and emerge usually the next season and start the whole thing again. But um, so there's more than four, most of them are these solitary bees, but there are, there's a small group of them are the bumblebees and bumblebees are different from all the rest because they're social. They're social insects like ants and termites and, and honeybees. They're what we call primitively eusocial. So they're truly social. They, they have a social organization with workers and queens and so on, but they're primitive in the sense they don't have fancy castes or, you know, soldiers and, uh, you know, lesser workers and greater workers and all these things. They just have a simple uh, worker group that are the daughters of the queen and those workers help raise the following generations and so on. So uh, it's a very simple organization. The colonies aren't that big. Um, and we'll get into more into that in a, in a few minutes, but just to talk about their relation in the in, e in ecology, of course, we all know bees are pollinators, but bumblebees are really key for a few families of plants that are important to us. So if you're out hiking on the mountains on Burke Mountain or up in the woods above, uh, you know, the lower mainland, anything that's in the blueberry family, like blueberries, or like these, these are what we call in Whitehorse low bush cranberries but really they're more properly lingonberries, vaccinium vitus idea. So anything that's vaccinium with these nice little bell-shaped flowers, they're tiny flowers, but they don't give up their pollen that easily. And you have to really shake the flower to the pollens are up there in tubes. So you, you uh, need something big and buzzy to buzz. Bumblebees, you wouldn't get little, uh, uh, low bush cranberries like this. This is what everybody in Whitehorse goes out in the fall to pick are these cranberries, lingonberries. September and you'll get a big feast. But, and this is key to the rest of the talk too, they're also really important buzz pollinators for members of the tomatoes and squash family who need that similar big buzz to pollinate. 
Uh, so honeybees don't do well with these sorts of things and other, other flies and so on. So in the last uh, 30 years or so, bumblebees have been developed as commercial pollinators for these vast greenhouses of tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and things like that. So they are now a commercial thing. So what they are not, and this is, I'm putting this in because this is a real common misconception. Bumblebees and other wild bees in Canada and North America, when we talk about bumblebee declines and bee declines and the bees are in trouble, they are not honeybees, okay? Honeybees in North America are an agricultural uh, species. They are the chickens of the bee world, you know? So if we're out and talking about bird conservation, we don't talk about raising chickens. We love eggs, we raise chickens. We love chickens, we raise chickens. We love honey, we raise honeybees. We need honeybees to pollinate certain crops like, like uh, fruit crops or uh, uh, almonds and things like that. There are busy workers and so that we, we really depend on them. I don't wanna knock honeybees a little bit, but any, any bit, but please don't think you're doing wild bees any good by raising honeybees because uh, you know you're making great honey and I appreciate that but uh, you're not helping the wild bees. So that's my little rant, sorry. Um, bumblebee year, so what happens in a bumblebee colony? So up, we'll start up in the top in the spring, I don't know if you can see my cursor here waving around, but uh, this is the queen bumblebee comes out in the first warm days of spring and God knows when it happens down there a lot earlier than up here. But I would assume that things really get going there. And I spent a long time in the lower mainland, so I do know when it gets warm. But even though the flowers start to come out early on in March and so on, I'm pretty sure the bumblebees really get going probably in early April, maybe late March, uh, where the queens come out and really start growing a colony. Uh, they, you might see queens in February and, and even in January on nice days come out and have a look around. But uh, for the most part, they stay still until the, the spring really gets going. Up here in Whitehorse, it's mid-May kind of thing. You'll see them early in May, but uh, by mid-May. So they, they start, the queens begin by feeding on the flowers and gathering pollen and nectar and uh, building a little colony here in a usually almost always I would say in a cavity in the ground like in an old vole burrow or a rabbit burrow if you have you know, rabbits making burrows in your area uh, or um, you know ground squirrels or something like that something that builds a, a tunnel in the ground the bees don't do it themselves so they kind of depend on other things to at least start it um, they they build a, a colony in these in these little hollows, and they might excavate a little bit to kind of clean it up and make it a bit bigger. But then they lay their eggs in these little cells that they build. They're not like wax, nice honeycombs, but they're little cells. And so she lays an egg in each one, and then provisions each one with with pollen and with with a bit of honey honey too. They make a little bit of honey to feed their young, and the larvae grow. And the first uh, generation comes out and become workers. They're all daughters of her. Um, we'll find out later that female bees are all the, you know, like, so anyways, I'll get on to that in the later, I won't go there. Anyways, they're the daughters of the queen that come out and become her workers. And then they help her rear the next batch of young. So all in the early part, she's on her own. If you see bees early on in the spring out foraging, they're all queens. And uh, they're feeding their young, they're doing everything. They're single moms. Later, you'll see a lot of other smaller, slightly smaller bees. Sometimes they're, they're not obviously small, but they are smaller and they, they are helping their mother feed the next generation. And this goes on for a couple of generations. Up here in Whitehorse, we basically only get one of these worker generations in before the final one. But down south, you might get two or three. So the colony gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It never gets as big as a honeybee colony because, uh, well, we'll see in a minute. But uh, by the end of the summer, it might have 200 in it or something like that, 100, 200, in the low hundreds. 
Um, up here in Whitehorse, it might be even less than 100, maybe 50 or 60 or something like that of, of workers. But then late in the summer, and by late summer in the bee world means probably mid-August to late August. So not, not late September and October. I know you get beautiful falls down there. But um, this is when the, the uh, reproductive generation comes out. The, the males and the, and the new queens come out in the late summer and fall, and they go around and find mates and uh, mate, as this picture shows. And then all the workers, all the males, the, this old queen, they die. They die as the flowers fade and the, and the feeding gets more and more difficult and this frost start to come. Those, those bees all die. And the queen goes off, the new queens that have mated and storing their sperm in there. They don't fertilize the eggs right away. They, they go off and find a place to spend the winter, a nice cozy place under a log, in a rotten log, uh, under your big leaf litter that you've uh, kept in your garden to help the bees and the birds, uh, somewhere that's out of the weather. And, uh, and uh, then they spend the winter in that cozy little place and then come out the next spring. So that's, sorry, I probably spent too long on that, but that's the bumblebee year. So what then do they need? Well, you can see that they need food throughout the season from early spring right to late summer. And so they can't depend on one kind of flower. They need to be generalists when it, when it uh, comes to feeding their young and themselves. Uh, some of those little uh, solitary bees are quite specific as to what they feed on. But these bumblebees need flowers like these willow blossoms early in the spring here in Whitehorse. Uh, right through to goldenrods in the fall. So up here it's like dandelion season, you know, and then it's, you know, all the nice uh, pea family, the, the oxytropus here, the local weeds and such like along the roadsides, the fireweeds, you know, up here. Um, and, uh, you know, and then at the end of summer up here in late July, we get this nice invasive white sweet clover, which is terrible for many things, but bumblebees love it. And uh, that sort of signals the end of the bumblebee year here. So when the white sweet clover is finished, uh, the bumblebees are kind of, they're not, there's nothing much more for them to find. So, uh, but as I said before, they do need these rodent burrows or other underground places to nest, and they need that cozy place to hibernate. So that I mean, that's what a bumblebee ecosystem looks like. And uh, within that, they can be uh, pretty, they're pretty generalist. So British Columbia bumblebees, um, there are uh, 33 native species known from British Columbia. And one is introduced, and it's introduced from those greenhouses by accident. But it is one of the common ones in sort of urban and suburban Vancouver now. So identification, as I mentioned before, these are big, colorful things with nice patterns. Uh, so in some ways, they're easy to identify. But in other ways, it's like birds, you know, like some birds are really super easy to identify. You can identify a red winged blackbird from from a long ways away. Uh, but um, things like impidnex flycatchers can be really challenging until they sing. And unfortunately, bees don't sing. So we're stuck with a bit and because they're stinging insects, they've developed this, um, this uh, mimicry, this uh, Mullerian mimicry, we call it these, they, they mimic each other so that uh, birds and other things don't have to learn a bunch of patterns that are, that are nasty stinging things. So a lot of them have this pattern, which is sort of yellow, orange, yellow, you know, and uh, if you see a bee like that, you kind of know which group of bee bumblebees you're looking at, but you have to look much more carefully then at the pattern to tell you what you you found. And then there's males, which are a little bit different and everything like that. But uh, the good news is there's a guide. It's a the guide came out about five years ago. It's that, that one, this one, I got it right here um, from Princeton University, really good guide, but it's kind of made like the, like the first tries of many field guides it's made by all these experts who know what they're talking about and, and are the best bumblebee people. But, and they really wanted to be right and careful 
so they're a bit too right and careful and and it's a bit too technical uh, i would say for the average beginner but if you're if you're okay to to get through that part then uh it's a really wonderful guide and uh, you can use it to uh, tell you what you've got it's still challenging but uh there you go so if you're looking at a bee, then, you know, just like when you're looking at a bird, you're mentally asking some questions, you know, like, is there a wing bar? Is there that? So in bees, you're looking at and you're asking these questions. You're asking things like, is there orange on the abdomen? That If there's orange on the abdomen, you've already kind of separated out half the bumblebees. Or is it just yellow? Uh, where is it orange? Is it orange in the middle? Is it in? Is it orange in the back? Where is it yellow? Is it or yellow in the back and the front or just in the front? And how wide is that yellow? All these things just so... So as you're looking at it in the first few seconds, you're looking at it. These are the kind of things, and the, but it's important to know that you got to look at all the pieces of the bumblebee. So you have to look at the face. Is the face black or yellow? That's a really important question. And this is the toughest one. Is the face long or short? And I'm still not very good at this myself. And you have to get, of course, a really good look at it. And sometimes you have to take a really good picture of it and then take that back and blow it up and look at it and see what kind of face it's got. But uh, that sometimes is needed, but uh, hopefully you don't get a species that that's needed on. And uh, are there pollen baskets? And so here on this bee, you can see on the back leg here, these the near the end of the back leg, the, the leg is broad and flat. And that's the bumblebee's pollen baskets. And if the leg is just round and narrow there, you've got a whole different kind of bumblebee. So it's good to know what uh, if there's baskets or not. If you see pollen on the leg, you know you've got pollen baskets. And the most important question of all, where am I? Uh, this is the most important question of any naturalist, of course. You have to know where you are and what, what you are expecting to see there. You know, if you're up on the top of a mountain, there's a different kind of group of bumblebees. If you're down in Mexico, there's a different, uh, different group. And if you're up in the Yukon, there's a different group. So you need to know where you are. And then you also need to ask, is this even a bumblebee? Because unfortunately, Bumblebees mimic each other, but there's all sorts of harmless flies and other things that mimic bumblebees. So here's, there's a whole family of flies called the flower flies. This is one Volucella up in uh, the Haynes Road. Looks just like a bumblebee. But here's the, here's your key here. You, you know, we we're always taught that bumblebees and bees have four wings and flies have only two wings. But it's really hard to tell when you're looking at these bees on flowers or flower, flies on flowers, whether there's four wings there or two wings. But if you look at their face and see their antennae here, they're tiny little feathery things on this fly. But if you looked back at this bumblebee, you can see that their antennae are these long stringy things. So flies and, wa and bumblebees and wasps have totally different antennae. So that's the, the easy way to tell them. So this is a flower fly. And so is this, this is a nice little flower fly again from the Haynes Road, different species, Aristolus, Flava peas. Here's a reindeer uh, bot fly, uh, a, a caribou bot fly up in the Mackenzie Mountains in Northwest Territories. Looks just like a looks just like a bumblebee. And here's one from John Reynolds. I stole this from my naturalist John. If you're there, Lafria fernalde from the Skagit, a beautiful bumblebee mimic of these big uh, robber flies. But again, you can see that it's got bigger antennae, but it, they're short and stubby. And here's another bumblebee mimic, uh, a narcissus bulb fly. If you have daffodils in your garden, you'll often see these on your flowers because these are introduced pests that come with the daffodils and uh, live the, the larvae live in the bulbs. Anyway, so here's six common bumblebees. I just picked these at random. You know, there's probably, as I said, about 15 or 20 species you could possibly see in Metro Vancouver. But uh, these are probably the six commonest or among the six commonest. So just to give you an idea, you can see most of them have orange, some of them don't. So one of them is called the Vancouver bumblebee. That's nice to know. And that's a new name because uh, it was just split. It used to be called the two-form bumblebee. But uh, the original species is now restricted to Utah and that area of the continent. And the rest of the area uh, is Bombus vancouverensis. It's really the Vancouver Island bumblebee, I must say. That's what vancouverensis refers to. But this is the commonest bumblebee throughout much of British Columbia and the Yukon, Southern Yukon. <clears throat> and it's really distinctive. It's got these beautiful patterns, bright, whitey, light yellow um, bands on the thorax. 
but most importantly in between on the back here there's a black line that cuts that band in half and gives it the important appearance of having two kind of big shoulder blade white shoulder blades there and that black continues down and divides these lines in orange anyways it sort of goes yellow black yellow black yellow orange orange yellow black it's quite a beautiful set of patterns it's not simple at all and very common and then there's the yellow fronted bumblebee here which is a kind of a duller goldeny bumblebee but with half the abdomen is gold the front half is all gold it's two big segments of the abdomen and then much of the rest of the abdomen is orange or red so it's yellow fronted it's called the yellow fronted because it's got this yellow face here but mostly what you see is this pattern on the abdomen the big broad yellow in here and then the black tailed another common one here looks a lot like the yellow fronted but you can see the yellow on the abdomen is really narrow the yellow behind the head on the thorax here like this one has nice bright your pale yellow this one the black tailed has very dingy dingy colored here and it does have a black tail but that's the the least of the pattern almost the sitka bumblebee is the bumblebee of the coast as its name you know implies it originally found in sitka alaska and it's another one of these very dingy colored bumblebees with this olive it's got a lot of black in with the yellow in the front here to give it an olive appearance and then it's got these yellowish olive bands on the abdomen and black. Nothing fancy or bright about it. And the fuzzy horned is kind of like the yellow fronted, but it's it's got a yellow, black, or red on the on the and the abdomen. Nice band there, and this sort of dull blackish yellow front here. You don't have there won't be a quiz, honest. You don't have to memorize all this stuff. But uh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Previous. But the most common bumblebee, I believe there, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't been there lately, and this is a recent phenomenon, the yellow-faced bumblebee, as opposed to the yellow-fronted bumblebee. And this is a striking bumblebee with pale yellow, creamy, bright, whitey yellow on the thorax and head that looks like a helmet. And then it's all black within the, with a pale band along the abdomen. And then, but it's mostly black with these two yellow things at the front. And a huge portion of the bees you'll see in your garden, I believe, are now these things. And these things first arrived in um, in uh, the lower mainland in the 90s, maybe in the 70s. They were, they were, they were always, I think, in the Okanagan, like very rarely. They're a, they're a bee of California and Oregon, really. But in the 90s, they first made their appearance in, uh, in the Vancouver area, in the lower mainland. And there's some friends of it as well, but it really took over. Whether it was introduced here by accident, we don't know, or whether it just was like the house finch and came up north as climate change helped it and people planted all their flowers. But now it's a, it's a super producer bumblebee. It produces way more workers than the other bumblebees, much larger colonies, and has really taken over. And there's three similar species. You don't have to, these, the, this is Voznesenskii, the yellow fronted one. And there's these other two that you should look for if you're serious about it. But seriously, these are very rare and uh, you can tell them apart, but I won't go into the details. This one has the yellow band on a different part of the abdomen. This one has a little ditch in the, in the yellow band there and so on. Uh, but 99.9% uh, .9 of what you'll see would be Voz, Voz as we call it. So that's a little take on bumblebees in general, now a bit on uh, bumblebees at risk. So I think if you look at your gardens full of bumblebees, you know, you may not notice that bumblebees have declined and, and some bumblebees like Wozniczynski have not declined. In fact, they've increased and other bumblebees are probably doing okay. But there's four particular ones in your area that have really declined and declined from being very common like this western bumblebee here this is a male i took this picture up in uh, manning park uh last a couple of summers ago um but they used to be in victoria and vancouver they're like the one in every three bumblebees you would see in the 80s for example would be a western bumblebee now i don't know 
when the last Western bumblebee was seen in the lower mainland, but they're still occasionally seen in Victoria and Vancouver Island. And uh, as I said, you can still find them in the mountains occasionally. They're gone from the lower elevations in the Okanagan Valley, but you can still find them up in the mountains. But really, they've gone from being the commonest bumblebee to one of the rarest. And that, that happened back in the late 80s, early 90s. So this is the Western bumblebee from California right up through to the Arctic and Alaska. And then they have an Eastern version of the Western bumblebee called the yellow banded bumblebee. We'll get into the distribution of these. So these are an east-west pair, just like the red shafted and yellow shafted flickers. There's the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee and the Yisuckley's cuckoo bumblebee. So all these bees have really declined. As these guys' names suggest, these cuckoo bees are parasites, are nest parasites, just cuckoo birds are, or cowbirds are. They're like the cowbirds for these two bees here. And then there's another one back east of in this group uh, that these two parasites as well. So these guys have made the mistake of parasitizing bees that get into trouble and now they're in even bigger trouble as it were. So those are the four I'm just going to talk a bit about now. So the western bumblebee comes in two forms, a southern one which is the, the occidentalis form and it's now classified as threatened under by Kosiwik, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. It's quite an easy bee to identify in the lower mainland. There's nothing really else like it. It does look a bit like Wasnazenskia in the sense that it has this yellow, black, black, white end to the abdomen, but they, the end of the abdomen is all this big white bum. It's not a little stripe, it's a big white bum. And it's got a black face. It's very black up here on the head, whereas that other one was whitish yellow all the way up here. And um, it's a really robust, big, fat bee, you know? So it's quite striking when you see it. Up here in the north in Whitehorse, this is from my garden in, in Whitehorse, this one. Uh, it looks quite different. It's shaggy and it's got that stripe a bit like Wasnazenski eye almost. Uh, and it doesn't have the white bum. It has sort of a palish thing. Uh, and it may turn out that these are different species, but right now they're called subspecies. Uh, but we can talk a bit about it. Here's the eastern one, the yellow banded bumblebee. And you can see it looks very similar to the western, except that instead of this black abdomen with a white bum, it's got kind of a basically big broad yellow band here with a dark abdomen. And it's special concern. We can get into the details later if you want. But here's the map, the, the yellow banded bumblebee, the big blue range here, and the western bumblebee, the green, and the northern one, the McKay's bumblebee, where I live is all red. And they, and they, there's quite a thin line here. We don't know much about this meeting place in here, but if you drive the, the Stuart Cassier Highway here, it's quite a narrow band where you go from one form to the other. And you can see the, the yellow banded bumblebee comes quite a ways into central BC, into the Robson Valley, Prince George area, where it's quite common. And there's another relative, the rusty patch bumblebee in southern Ontario, but it's got so rare, it's essentially gone from Canada and it's really rare in the southern part of its range. It's uh, in a few places in the, the Midwest. So these group, this western yellow banded and rusty patched are all members of the genus, uh, the subgenus Bombus. They're, so they're within the bumblebees, they're all closely related. They're, they're in the same part of the tree. And so there's something about them that made them susceptible to something so that they are the ones that really declined and the other bumblebees around them did not. Incident, uh, coincident, I'm not, not coincidentally, but curiously, there is another member of this group that's in North America, which is totally not at risk in the subgenus Bombus. It's a whole Arctic species found all across Asia and uh, through Ireland and Great Britain. And, and in North America, it's in the far Northwest. If I go up the, you know, it's, it's in my garden here, but if I go uphill into the subalpine, it's the common bumblebee. And it's common all the way down the mountains as far as Banff. So it's doing very well, but it tends to live in these places away from people too. So that might say something. Um, so here's the Suckley's cuckoo bumblebee. It looks a bit like that Western bumblebee, if you remember. It's yellow, you know, black face, yellow, black, and then a pale end to that abdomen there. This is in this case, it's sort of pale yellow here. 
And it's the cuckoo bumblebee that was common in the West that really focused on the Western bumblebee. But it's found all across North America, uh, right to Newfoundland, but it's very rare. It's always been very rare in the East. Kind of like the, the three-toed woodpecker, you know, like it's really common in the mountains in the West and comes all the way across the boreal, but it's really rare in the, in the East. And it's Eastern version, the coo gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, uh, which is endangered now, uh, is the Eastern one that comes all the way across the boreal. Uh, and it's all across Asia as well. And curiously enough, it's still quite common in Europe. It's a uh, host there doing fairly well. And it's, you know, it's not common, but it's not, it's not rare. You can go out and find it. And it was really common in Eastern and Boreal Canada, rare in Southern BC, and never really found it. It was never part of the, the Coquitlam fauna, I can assure you. But in, in the Okanagan, it was rare and, and, uh, and so on, but uh, uh, very common in Eastern Canada. Here's a map just to show you. Um, these white dots are where the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee was, where there are collections from, but haven't been seen in the last 10 or 15 years. And these blue dots or aqua or whatever color that is, are where we found it in the last 10 years. So you can see it's quite common still in the Yukon. And there's a number of records from Alberta and Southern BC, but these are the result of intensive bumblebee surveys. So tens of thousands of bumblebees resulted in these 10 records. So they're very rare in the South, but they're still here. Uh, but they're quite relatively common in the North, in Alaska, Northwest Territories, in the Yukon, and probably in Northern BC and Alberta as well. Um, but down here where people look at bumblebees all the time, there's just nothing. There, there are just hardly any, uh, except one or two records in the northeastern part of the states lately. And interestingly enough, thanks to iNaturalist, John Reynolds might know this one, someone uh, photographed one, had excellent photographs of a gypsy cuckoo bumblebee with a uh, yellow banded bumblebee on flowers at Rimouski in Quebec this summer. So uh, there's hope yet, and it, it may still be common throughout the boreal here, but nobody goes looking. But down here where uh, people live and agriculture flourishes, these bees have done very poorly. And as I said before, it all started in the 1980s and early 1990s. This is from Calgary area. This is a Western bumblebee chart. It doesn't show what it was like before, but it basically went probably straight across that. This is a student thesis and uh, started this and then the uh, prof continued the work. So they actually did really good sampling methods here so we can trust these numbers. Uh, but you can see it just went straight downhill until 2010 and you cannot hardly find them anymore in that area. So what caused this sudden drop in you know 1985? You can see in 1985, they were still common. Uh, probability of collecting it was 0.4. That's a huge probability. That's almost every other time you go out looking at bumblebees. And now it's down below, you know, 0.1. So what happened at the same time? So well, we don't have a smoking gun, as it were, of, of these declines, but we do have some strong circumstantial evidence. So what happened was in Western bumblebee and the yellow banded bumblebee and the rest, rusty patch, at that time, these fungal pathogens, these microsporidia called nosema, really there was a lot of disease in these bees. They, they became very sick with these fungal pathogens. And these are native pathogens. They've always been around, uh, but for some reason they became very, uh, they, they had a big outbreak in them. And this can deform wings. It can decrease the survival of workers and males, can prevent queens from mating. Basically it, things do very poorly. And it's far more prevalent in these bombus bombus the subgenus bombus the western and, and the other bumblebees like it than it is in other bumblebees and so what caused this well again it's just coincidence but it coincided with the beginning and massive use of managed bumblebees in greenhouses in fact when greenhouses first started using managed bumblebee colonies in the West, they used Western bumblebees because they didn't want to use Eastern ones. They, they were conscious that they didn't want to introduce foreign bumblebees into the system. So they used Western bumblebees, but Western bumblebees tended to get very sick and die 
and didn't do very well as as greenhouse uh, operators. So they now use common eastern bumblebees, this one here, to do all that work. And they're very good at it. And uh, we get wonderful tomatoes and uh, wonderful cucumbers. But the idea is that these eastern bumblebees carry these nosema. And when they're in these colonies inside greenhouses all contained, they, they get these outbreaks of nosema. It builds up in them. And then some of them escape these greenhouses and go out and start foraging outside, leaving the diseased, uh, you know, the gut parasites on the flowers and the bumblebees outside pick it up and, and uh, it infects the local populations and causes declines. So that's called the pathogen spillover effect. There's also honeybee issues that we don't know as much about their effect on bumblebees and it probably didn't cause those big declines, but they, they aren't helping in the long run. Honeybees have very similar pathogens. They have nosema as well, and they have other pathogens that they carry with them, and they visit the same flowers as bumblebees and pass those along. Uh, they have viruses like deformed wing virus and other black queen virus and things like that that can be transferred to bumblebees, and bumblebees do get it. And you can measure the incidence of these diseases in bumblebees as a product of the distance from nearby hives, and they and they decline away from the hives. So. It is, it is a, a thing. And we all know that honeybees are very, you know, busy bees. They're very efficient workers and they can outcompete native bees when there's limited pollen and nectar. And when I say limited pollen and nectar, I mean in these situations where there may not be a lot of flowers available to wild bees. And uh, like a little colony of bees like this, honeybees like this with 40 or so hives, a standard one like this can collect 400 kilos of pollen in the three summer months that bumblebees are really out there looking themselves. So 400 kilos of pollen is quite a considerable amount for this area and it's probably within a kilometer of these apiaries that it really affects. So there's not a lot left over for the native bees in this situation. Now if you have one apiary in your backyard and you're in a wildish area or whatever or there's lots of flowers in people's gardens you may not you know, there may not be a problem and or it may be a problem just at the beginning of the season in the early spring when there are limited flowers and there's a lot of honeybees out pollinating crops or something like that. So um, they, they can be a problem. I know in certain places in the United States in federal lands, they banned apiaries in federal lands where there are uh, endangered bumblebees. Then there's pesticides and uh, insecticides first here. I'll go through them all. So these, these neonicotinoids, we hear about them all the time now, and they are a problem. They do, they are not supposed to kill bees, but they do, they don't kill bees directly, but they do uh, harm the bees. They get sick and they, you know, I'll go into that in a minute. But they, the main thing about neonicotinoids is that they came into effect or they really became popular after the declines began. So it, they didn't cause those big declines in the Western bumblebee, uh, but they are probably not helping any recovery because neonicotinoids, even in tiny, tiny amounts in the, in the ecosystem, uh, cause impaired learning and short-term memory loss in uh, worker bumblebees. And that leads to decreased foraging performance. They, they don't go out and they don't pick up as much pollen and it takes them longer and they get lost. They don't get back to the colony in time. So that means there's reduced queen production, fewer larvae are, are reared, and ultimately colony failure. So neonicotinoids are not good things, especially when sprayed on foliage, like in fruit trees and things like that. And these are now, as of this spring, coming spring will be banned for many uses in Canada, but they're still going to be used extensively for a while anyways, on uh, canola and soybeans and corn in uh, GMO ready crops. So uh, there's replacements on the horizon, these things called sulfoxiflora and chlorinotrinyl plural. But again, we don't know much about them, but they, they also have been shown to cause reduced production in bumblebees and lethargy in workers and so on. So it's not a good situation. 
And uh, there's other insecticides, of course, we use outside agriculture in, in forestry, uh, in the eastern Canada, especially where there's uh, um, spruce budworm, there's tebufenazide, and tebufenazide has shown that it causes learning deficiencies in honeybees. But the one study that's been done on bumblebees has shown doesn't show any effect, so it may be okay, who knows. Herbicides, you know, herbicides are designed to kill plants, not bees. So you'd think that that'd be okay in many ways, and it certainly doesn't harm them directly. Here's some corn uh, nearby you folks in the Fraser Valley. And of course, corn and other things like it aren't bee crops anyways, uh, because they're wind pollinated. But most corn crops now, or many corn crops, and all, this, all the soybeans and canola in Canada are all GMO herbicide ready crops now. And that means that they're, they're genetically modified so that you can spray Roundup on these guys and they don't care. And so that's what we do now, instead of weeding or, or tilling you know, the, the, the weeds out, just spray with herbicides on our GMO crops. But you can see that alongside these crops along the roadside where the bumblebees might be foraging, there's all these nice weeds and little flowers and so on. But these guys aren't, uh, they're going to get uh, nailed by the herbicides, you know, through drip. So, and the uh, herbicide use because of these GMO crops has doubled since 2005. And in silviculture, there's a lot of use, of course, with uh, herbicides to uh, help uh, our little baby trees get a start. But uh, there's been little research on the effect on pollinators, but chances are it's not affecting in a gigantic way you know, population trends, but it doesn't help, you know, bees aren't going to be able to, you know, get uh, nectar and pollen out of these flowers. Then finally, there's fungicides and fungicides, of course, again, are supposed to kill fungi, not bees or not uh, anything else. And they aren't toxic to bees on their own. But curiously, when they did this big environmental study across the United States, looking at wet, uh, yellow banded bumblebee and western bumblebee, and then looking at those pathogens in their guts and then taking every environmental uh, measurement they could while they were doing that, the one feature that really predicted the amount of pathogen in bumblebee guts was their exposure to fungicide, this chlorothalonil. And that may indicate that bumblebees find it irritating or, or they get a bit sick and then they can't fight the the um, the fungal pathogens in their own guts but they it also might mean just that fungicide is so used in an agriculture that it might be just a measure of intensity of agriculture and that it's the intensity of agriculture it's something else about agriculture that's that's uh, causing these bees to get sick Finally, uh, not finally, but one we're getting near the end, uh, there's habitat loss. Of course, direct habitat loss. You can see this in, in your neighborhood, I'm sure. Conversion of meadows and woodlands and weedy margins to you know, suburban areas, to industrial areas. Suburban areas may not be that actually too bad because we actually create a lot of flower gardens and people are keen gardeners and they produce flowers that weren't there perhaps before when it was just dense forest or or such like, excuse me. And, uh, but there is a loss of floral resources when you get massive uh, warehousing and, and uh, commercial use and certainly loss of nesting and hibernation habitat. But when you look at it from the, the whole sort of continent wide piece of things, there's certainly going to be bee declines in these areas, but they won't cause these big declines from uh, you know 90% declines as we see in some of these bees. Uh, uh, as a result of this. It certainly doesn't help uh, bring back bees though in your neighborhood. And finally, I think this is the last threat I'm going to talk about. It's climate change, of course, like it's affecting everything. Bumblebees are these big furry insects that are cool adapted. They're insects of the north. There are no bumblebees in tropical lowlands. They're the only bumblebees in South America are up in the Andes, up in the top of the mountains. Most bumblebees are in the high mountains of Asia, the, but the most diversity of bumblebees is in the, in the Himalayas and in the Western mountains of North America. So, but the British Columbia has got a very diverse fauna because of that. 
but they're cool adapted to these uh, temperate areas. And as climate change brings hotter and hotter summers specifically, uh, here's the prediction for gypsy cuckoo bumblebee in Europe. You can see that now, as I said, it's, it's one of the common cuckoo bumblebees of Europe. This is now 2050 on the left. You can see it's all in, there's no green left in, in Central Europe here. It's all red and yellow. Red means it's kind of gone. And by 2100, the prediction is that, uh, you know, it'll be gone from much of Europe, even in Southern Scandinavia and will remain only in the uplands of far Northern Scandinavia. So, and this has already been shown to happen in North America for bumblebees. There's been big studies by Jeremy Kerr and his students at the University of Ottawa to show that uh, bumblebees are losing ground at the southern edge of their range. So when we really look at it, as I said, there's no smoking one gun, one thing, but it, it could be just the cumulative effects of all these, these factors that are causing these declines. But the big declines that happened in the late 80s and 90s were probably the result of this switch to uh, commercial use of bumblebees in greenhouses. And to add insult to injury, finally, bumblebees, and this is sort of the technical part, and I might not be able to explain this very well, but bumblebees have a different way of determining gender than we do. If you're a bumblebee and you're the product of a male, you know, a daddy bumblebee and a mummy bumblebee, and, and they get together and produce a fertilized egg, you are going to be a female. Females have two sets of chromosomes, one from the father and one from the mother. Males have only one set of chromosome from the mother. So they're from an unfertilized egg. So females are diploid as we call it and males are haploid. But the production of fertile females requires genetic diversity. So there's a, there's a gene on the, in the chromosomes that has to be diverse in those two sets of chromosomes that they get from the mother and the father. They have to be a little different. They have to be a different allele. And if they're the same, you won't be a fertile female, you will be a sterile male. So that's a bummer. And uh, so as populations become tiny, the chances of that happening increase dramatically. You get, diver you get much lower genetic diversity, so you get the much higher chance of sterile males produced. And uh, it's called the diploid male extinction vortex. So what can we do? That's all a bummer. So what can we do to help? We can regulate the managed bee industries. They've already got best management practices in place. We have to make sure that they follow them to prevent these escapes from greenhouses to keep those diseases out of our native bees. And uh, we can limit the sizes of honeybee apiaries on wild lands. Um, we need honeybees you know, to pollinate our big crops. That's true still, and we don't want to lose that. But we can limit the sizes of apiaries where the bumblebees thrive. And we can use these pesticides only when they're necessary. A lot of these now are used prophylactically. They're just sprayed to make sure that things are going to be fine without even having a problem to begin with. So we don't have to do it that way. We can wait till we find there's an issue and then deal with it. So just finally, what can you do as naturalists uh, to help out or to, you know, you can do what I just said, those, those, you know, we can make sure that our, hold our government to account and do our own little thing in our backyard, grow our uh, plants and, uh, and give them all sorts of good flowers and so on. But we can also keep track of things like naturalists love to do. We love to go out and take pictures and count things. And that's what these things like iNaturalist and the Bumblebee Watch, which is a similar uh, thing to iNaturalist, but strictly for bumblebees. I can tell you more about that if you want. Um, but I'm sure John Reynolds has told you all about iNaturalist and it's a wonderful thing. Either way, just basically take lots of pictures and share them in these, in these uh, apps. The, as I said before, it's important to, to get a lot of different looks at a bumblebee to know what it is. So don't just post one picture of a bumblebee. If you see a bumblebee on a flower and you've got a good chance to take a picture of it, don't take one picture, take 10 pictures, please. And post all 10 to these to this site as one as one observation. And that way the experts can really have a good chance of identifying it. If there's only one picture, chances are you know you've missed the face or something like that, and uh, and we won't be able to identify it. So that's great. And um, 
I had a picture in here which I've lost. Anyways. Uh, the other thing about iNaturalist, of course, is that it brings together all your observations with everyone else's observations from around North America, and you can create these big maps and uh, get all sorts of uh, other information out of them in addition to just what is in your backyard. So it's a great program to get involved with to do that. But in order to, to, to see if bumblebees are declining, we need a lot, much more specific information and we need to have repeatable and easy to undertake surveys that give us good data. You know, when we were sitting around the table at Kasiwik assessing these bumblebees, we were using all sorts of really crappy trend information and the fish people, especially who always have way too much information as John will know, um, they were very unhappy with us. And so we were thinking, what do we, what can we do to come back uh, next time and have better data and uh, so the idea hatched to do it like we count birds, you know, count bees like we count birds. The, the breeding bird survey, some of you probably do the breeding bird surveys in your neighborhood, uh, but we could have the bumblebee survey, you know, not, not the breeding bird survey, it's still BBS. But uh, these are roadside surveys done once a year all across North America by volunteers. And uh, we've done this now uh, for four years in the Yukon um, done it at about between 10 and 20 uh, routes a year. This is from the first year, just to show you, um, uh, to show you what, we, this is just the a full count. Uh, so this is the relative abundance, how much the percent of the, the fauna was in, was of each bumblebee species. So this one on the left, you can't read them. Of course, this is the Western bumblebee of all things was the commonest bumblebee in our surveys. So it's doing fine in the Yukon. So we found that out. And um, down here, the other ones with red stars are the gypsy cuckoo bumblebee here and the suckley's cuckoo bumblebee here. So they're obviously much rarer, but still, you know, that's that's one or two percent of the whole bumblebee fauna right there is gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, which is pretty good. So uh, we know they're doing probably okay in the Yukon. And whoops, and you can do this year after year, of course, and see if that relative abundance changes. And it's, it's a really a, an actual measure of actual abundance too, if you do these very repeatable surveys. So uh, we're uh, hoping that we can get people like yourself all across Canada interested in doing these surveys. So I'd love to, to hear from you if you are. And if Jenny Heron's on the call, I know she's, she's interested in, in uh, organizing some of these in British Columbia. So thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to stop sharing my screen and take your questions. Th thanks, Sid. Um, so we didn't have anything in the chat. So maybe we can uh, get people to unmute themselves and uh, um, ask some questions. And actually, we've got one. Uh, Jillian has asked a question. A question: uh, What makes a bumblebee bee rather than any other kind of bee? Well, as I mentioned before, they are um, they're a family of bees. Uh, you know, a gene. Well, there's there's a group of bumble. You know, they share a bunch of morphological things, which we needn't get into right now. But uh, they're colonial bees that. Uh, you know, if you're looking, I mean, is the question, I guess, if you're looking at a bumblebee, how do you tell it's a bumblebee? They tend to be big. That's one thing, the, the, especially the queens. And uh, they have these furry banded patterns on them. The solitary bees tend to be smaller. Um, the bumblebees, if you see, if you see a bee carrying pollen on its legs, it's either a honeybee or a bumblebee. And so honeybees, if you know, you know, many people aren't sure when they're seeing a honeybee or a bumblebee. I mean, maybe that's the question. Honeybees tend to be these brown and orange and yellowish sort of, they don't have these black and white and yellow and bright reddish patterns on them. So if you see bright orangey red on a bee, it's probably a bumblebee. If it's just strong black and yellow and white or something like that, it's a bumblebee. But if it's this sort of even yellowy brown banded color, then that's a honeybee. And honeybees tend to be smaller and not so furry. 
Um, the solitary bees don't carry pollen on their legs or they don't have these little baskets. Sometimes their legs are all furry and have, you know, pollen everywhere, but they'll, the leaf cutter bees, which are really common and diverse there, carry pollen on the underside of their belly. So their belly underneath is bright colored. It's depending on the pollen they're picking up, it's either bright red or yellow or white, uh, depending on what the pollen is. So it's hard to say just one thing, but um, the bumblebees are big and patterned like I saw in the pictures and the, and the honeybees are, are more subtly patterned with yellows and browns. Okay, and do we have uh, someone else with a question? Yeah, I had a question, Sid. Uh, I didn't realize till I listened to a lecture similar to yours some time ago that roughly about 80% of our bumblebees, if not more, actually live in the ground. And one of the challenges I see in our own neighborhood, and I'm sure it's happening in a lot of urban centers, is with people putting in either river rock because of the chafer beetle or going to astroturf, unfortunately, we're taking away important habitat. And it strikes me that bees need corridors to travel within urban areas. So all those pockets where they could travel or inhabit are being lost to those bees. Uh, would you say that that's an issue as well? Yeah, I mean, not only, yeah, they need for, for nesting, they need not only ground that, they need ground that has burrows or hollows in it you know yep. they, they and so that's really important and they you can follow queen bees in the spring and they're and you can tell when they're searching for a place they're just going around little bushes and looking underneath testing out they if something looks like it's a hole they go down into it and walk around in it and see where it goes and go on to the next place and they'll go they'll go on and on and on and on you can follow them for quite a while they 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 don't usually find one while you're there that's for sure so it is important and these are rare, of course, in urban areas, like you say, and getting rare. So that's one thing you folks can contribute to the bees is in your neighborhood is to provide that natural ground. And you can also go online and look for bumblebee nest boxes. You can make your own nest boxes and they look an awful lot like a bird box, like a little chickadee box but with a kind of a tube instead of a, you know, where there's a hole where the bird comes in and out of, there's a tube that goes out and then you have to bury these things in the ground, right? Oh. So the tube comes out and the bumblebee can go down the tube into these boxes underground. Very few, as you mentioned, there's, there's, it's a species specific thing, but most species would never nest above ground. I've seen them occasionally in bluebird boxes, you know, nesting in a bluebird box. But uh, that, that I think there's one or two species that don't mind doing that, but most of them like the ground. I think people get confused between wasps nests and they assume that bees inhabit those. So they yeah, don't bees, realize. Yeah. yeah, I didn't mention wasps. I should, I should have a little slide about, you know, they're not yellow jacket wasps <laughs> either. Because of course, yellow jacket wasps are the common things you might see in your backyard in August and September. And and uh, they are related in the sense that they're all in the big wasp group, but and the and the yellow jackets are also another colonial member of that group. But uh, they're the ones that, and it's only, and only about a third, a quarter, or a third of the yellow jackets net build those aerial nests up in the you know on bushes and up under your porch. Most yellow jackets nest in the ground. In underground but they build those paper nests underground but so bees in the in the urban areas do need something to get in the ground in a hollow place like a little you know people don't want rodents around their house but uh that's what they need uh and um they also need for the the hibernation you know like leaf litter you know like everybody's pretty tidy these days and we go around under our rhododendrons and everything and rake up all the leaves and put them in the big plastic bags from Canadian Tire and have people take them away. And, uh, but the, that leaf litter and all the stuff that sits on the forest floor is what the queens need to crawl under for, the, for their hibernation and some rotten logs or something like that. And someone else with a question. Kathy. Hey, Brian. Oh, Kathy, sorry. Kathy. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, 
up, you might have just answered this. I do have leaf litter uh, in my yard, and I'm just wondering, would I see a bee? Would it be kind of comatose, legs up, or should we just leave them there if we find one? Yeah, I would just cover it up again. I don't know, because I live in Whitehorse where they're definitely comatose. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but I know uh, there was a, there was a, on Twitter, there was kind of a, you know, in the bumblebee crowd on Twitter, there was a, an effort in the fall to go around and look for hibernating bees because people, the bee people didn't really know exactly, you know, they every once in a while someone finds a bee hibernating and so they're going, oh yeah, that's where the queens are. But nobody's really actually gone out in a systematic way and surveyed for this or tried to find out where most of the bees do hibernate. And so there was a significant effort in the last couple of falls, you know, people in California and Oregon and Illinois going out and scrabbling around under trees and bushes and, and digging up the leaf litter looking for hibernating bees. And they were all kind to the bees. I'm sure they covered them up again, but uh, they did find a few. And in some of these, this Eastern, the common Eastern bumblebee that I showed from the greenhouses, it's now known to to often hibernate in groups, right? So the queens all get together and keep each other warm under these, in these situations. But uh, I assume you would just find one just comatose there. It would, it would look alive, you know, it would probably wiggle its legs and walk away or, you know, but it wouldn't fly unless it was really warm. Okay. And on the warm days, like it's not warm now, but when it gets to be plus five or plus 10 again, and it's sunny in, in January and February, you'll see them flying around visiting flowers, you know? As I said, I don't think they're really starting. Some of them start colonies then, and uh, especially Voznesensky might get a head start on things. I'm not sure, but uh, but most of them would be a bit later. Yeah. So if there's one more question out there, I'll take it. Um, yeah. Another Bruce. question? Yeah, I was going to say, you real Bumble, I, I've always taught the scene that the bumblebee is bigger than the, the honeybee. And um, also the bumblebees don't stink. So, I mean, right? I mean, there's no, those kind of bees don't sting. Only the honeybee that stings, stings well, us in the wasp. Is that right? Well, the, bump, the female honeybee, uh, the female bumblebees, the queens and the workers, they can all sting. Ah, okay. And uh, I can tell you when I'm catching the bumblebees, because our surveys involve catching them, you occasionally get stung. Uh, the males wow. don't sting, just like male honeybees or male uh, wasps don't sting because they don't have the package to do that. But uh, the difference is, I think what people maybe are trying to say is that honeybees, the workers, when they sting you, you know, they leave that stinger behind in your hand, you know, it comes out and the end of the abdomen all pulls away. Whereas every other wasp and bee doesn't do that. They sting you and you'll get stung and you go, yow. But it, it's just a quick jab in and out. It's like getting your COVID shot, you know, like boom, and then it's gone. And then uh, it hurts just the same, but it uh, there's no stinger left in you. I'll be a little bit more wary now when I'm in the garden because I'm supposed to go, oh, are they just bumblebees? It doesn't matter. And I'm busy around. around. <laughs> no, you'll be all paranoid. Yeah. Fortunately, I haven't ever been stung. So. <laughs> Once you get familiar with bumblebees, though, later in the summer when the males come out and they get to be really common and they, and the males are just like, you know, I hate to make generalizations, but they're kind of lazy and just like hang out, you know, and they, because they don't have any job to do other than find females. So most of the time they just like hang out in gangs on flowers, right? And they, and they're very lazy looking. They're almost comatose, even on nice days. Uh, but uh, they're a slightly different shape than the females and they got slightly longer antennae and they're slightly sort of fuzzier. So once after, after you get a while, you, you can identify, you can say, well, that's a male and you can pick them up and they're, they're quite gentle little guys and they don't sting you. But. Yes. So you yeah. can impress your friends if, <laughs> if you're brave. Okay. I, I'll now turn it over to Victoria. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm already unmuted. Well, thank you so much, Sid. I want to say that was really just the bee's knees. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fabulous, fabulous, informative presentation and certainly got me really excited about uh, watching the bees in my garden this summer. I'm just going to share the screen here for a moment and announce that in 
honor of Sid and his presentation to us this evening, we are going to hold EMN's first ever photo contest. How come I can't do this, get this big? There we go. Um, to spot the first bumblebee of spring of 2021. And the rules are outlined here, pretty simple. Um, go out in maybe late March or early April, but keep an eye out if the weather ever warms up here in the uh, upcoming. I, I would go out earlier than that if you want to win this contest. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Well, not right, not this week anyway. Not I think this we're, week, safe. No. we're safe this week. Um, take a photo, and why not try to identify your bee? Use iNaturalist or. Um, you can use a key that was actually in, I think, the August newsletter of the uh, Burke Mountain Naturalist. I'll put that on our website again and the little article that goes with it. And as Sid basically said, there's only about six or seven bees that you're most likely to see here. So we'll try to get our first bee identified. And maybe we could send the photos to Sid just for confirmation, if that would be, if that would be all right. Sure. And well, yeah, and I'll try to, maybe I'll try to keep my eyes open for it on iNaturalist. I'll, I'll, uh, I don't usually look down in the BC area of iNaturalist. I'm busy enough looking at the Yukon ones, but there's a fellow, one of the world experts on bumblebees is super active on iNaturalist. His name is John Asher, and he usually identifies bumblebees within 24 hours. Fantastic. <laughs> well, that's what we'll need. Anyway, when you get your photo, you get it identified, submit it to the uh, general Gmail of the Burke Mountain Naturalist. And your prize is stunning. Your photo will be in the newsletter of the Burke Mountain Naturalist, along with your name. So that's something very desirable. Now, my only regret after listening to Sid's talk is that we didn't start this contest 30 years ago when BMN was formed, because wouldn't that be interesting? We might have been getting Western bumblebees as the first bees. But it's better late than never. So um, that's what we're going to do. I'll put it in the March newsletter as well. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand the mic over to Lori Austin, who is the chair of our Education and Conservation Committee. And she's got a few items to tell you about that uh, that committee has been working on. So Lori, if you want to pick up the mic. There we go. Sorry, I've been having a little bit of trouble with my, my mouse lately. Um, I have a couple of announcements to make uh, about Colony Farm. And first, I'd just like to start off by thanking all the people who have been working so hard in the last couple of months uh, to attend meetings, write letters, visit Colony Farm, and do a whole lot of work um, regarding our concerns about the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion staging project. So I'm just gonna read off the names and I hope I don't leave anybody out. Thank you to Jane Thompson, who started the petition and you can still sign it. it there's a link in our newsletter about it. Thank you to John Saremba and Christina Saremba, Victoria Otten, Jim and Judy Atkinson, Elaine Golds, Liz Thunstrom, Edie Kernigham, Catherine Ho, Brian Warmold, Ian MacArthur, and I believe John Reynolds also has helped out. So thank you to all those people. Um, so there have been a couple of meetings since the article that was put in the newsletter um, that John Saramba and I wrote. And uh, you might be interested to know that uh, we found out that the CP rail spur um, is also going to be used as well as the colony farm park land. So that was a bit of a surprise. We thought maybe it was an alternative site. Turns out they're using both parts. Um, we're meeting regularly with Metro Vancouver Parks and Trans Mountain. Hopefully we're having a once a month meeting over the next little while. So one thing that 
we're hoping to do, um, there's a real lack of information uh, about what sort of environmental assessments have been done. And we haven't been able to have that information shared with us yet. We're hoping that it will be in the future. But in the meantime, uh, we have a bit of an idea, but I have to say this is a non-BMN sponsored activity. So I'm going to tell you about it and it's up to you whether you want to do it on your own. So I'm really not organizing you at all, but I'm just going to suggest that you might like to participate in this. What we really need is a lot more data collected down on Colony Farm about birds, vegetation, or any other wildlife. So if you're able to visit the farm on a regular basis and take pictures, post them on iNaturalist, that would be really helpful. If you want to do a regular uh, bird survey, uh, a walk once a week or more, and uh, collect some data, put it on eBird, share it with people. You could even share it with me, it's just a suggestion. And we can collect more data. We can see what's going on before construction starts, during, and follow it up after, uh, even during the restoration process. So these are just some suggestions. Right now, we can't organize anything with our club. Uh, Metro Vancouver may be doing some research, but they can't have volunteers work with them right now either. So we're kind of in a bind. We just need people to go out on their own, collect the data and post it. So if you're interested, um, please email me and I can keep you in the loop as things develop. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Lori, just one thing, I don't know if you mentioned or not, I didn't catch it, that um, construction is supposed to start around March 8th. Is that That's correct? That's right. Yeah. Oh. So right now we can walk, um, it's basically the West Field area. You can do the whole uh, loop around the, uh, the trail loop around the area, but how Are there any other questions? Thank you. Okay, I think, uh, is it over to Brian then? Uh, well, Brian was gonna or have some- Back to Ian. <laughs> sure, back to me, I guess. Okay. So um, we're gonna go into some wildlife sightings and I believe Brian was gonna share a screen uh, with some, some photos that were submitted. Okay, okay. Thank you, Ian, appreciate it. Um, Yes, as uh, we had in the uh, in the notification of the meeting tonight, if you uh, had any wildlife sightings, we're going to resurrect that and see if we can do it in a similar vein as we do it in a normal meeting. So, um, uh, if if uh, if you have any uh, wildlife sightings, please uh, send them to um, to us, and uh, we'll take it from there. But uh, at the moment, we have uh, what we have so far. We have a couple of submissions. So I will share my screen. Okay. And share. Uh, can everybody see my screen? It uh, says the yep. Wildlife Gallery. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. Okay, fabulous. So we have a number of photos that have been submitted for this month. So uh, thank you so much. Um, let's go through. And there we go. Uh, first up from uh, John Saremba is a muskrat uh, taken on the 5th of February and uh, at uh, Colony Farm. Oh, that's a great shot. Mm. It oh, is. Thank Ryan, you. Ryan, did you want us to make a comment about the picture? Uh, seeing it's your photo, I think you're quite at liberty to do so. Yes. <laughs> what? This ties in nicely with what Laurie was just talking about. There's a lot of misconceptions about 
the Colony Farm Perimeter Trail, where they're going to be using for the Trans Mountain staging area. And the more times I've walked this in the last couple of months, the more I realize just how diverse this habitat is. When you first see it, it's just, everybody calls it old field or grassy field, but it is amazing just how diverse it is. And this picture was taken just across the road from the outlet of one of the streams that actually flows from this area, from the uh, western boundary of Colony Farm, it flows right across the field and feeds a little wetland. There's an accompanying picture that I sent along that I looked at this little area. It was about two, there it is there, two by three meters, what I call pocket wetland. And I happened to stop and find this little muskrat enjoying this, this area. And these are the types of many habitats I refer to that are so vital. And one of the concerns we have, there's a lot of talk about, well, we're going to minimize the effects right on the project site. But we're also concerned with effects that can go off the project site. And particularly if you have a small petroleum or diesel or gas fuel spill on the project site, we're worried about given all the drainage and these pocket wetlands and large wetlands, the effects on these and the animals that, that are critical to rely on these. And it's only when you have a chance and I really ask members, this is the least used probably part of the park to take the time to have a walk before March 4th where they start putting up the fences to walk that uh, Western trail and just stop and observe and see the incredible rich diversity and to try and educate others about this misconception that it's just a grass field, it's already been disturbed, it won't have much impact. So that was what I meant by showing these two pictures. Fabulous, thank you, John. Totally, thank you. And while you're on a roll. Okay, this is actually <laughs> uh, a great blue heron that is right on, I believe it's a birch tree which is immediately adjacent to the trail, which Trans Mountain will be putting up their staging area. And I just happened to catch this one heron who's a, a resident. I've seen it six or seven times when I've walked out on the trails. And the same day on an adjacent oak tree, there was four herons in the same tree. And this is once again, they won't be directly within the right away of the project, but I can't help but think how these birds will be affected when the equipment starts working with the noise and the odors from welding and assembling the pipe. I just worry about the effects on the birds. And that's why it's so important to, for us as members to try and get out and see what happens to these birds during migration, breeding, nesting periods, from the trail, you can watch and, and see how they react to sounds. Are they moving from adjacent to this area, which is a beautiful old grassy field? Are they going to other parts of the park? So anything you can do to just on your own, have, have a look and report some of your observations. That'd be greatly appreciated. And again, John. Uh, all too often we say, oh no, Himalayan blackberry, this is all bad. Uh, years ago, Al Grass, uh, a fabulous naturalist, went to graze the grain and said, you know, maybe this blackberry isn't too bad in certain areas on a limited basis. And I was once again amazed. It's only when I walked by the trail, just how many song sparrows, uh, a fox sparrow, and certainly the, the towhees uh, actually hide and rely on the blackberry for protection. So this was just a shot of a towhee that braved to come out and pose for me. Thank you, John. And Sumit, you're up. Do you have a few words to say about your photo? Anything. <clears throat> uh, this is on my balcony. And I said, I put on there a swarm of, a swarm of, oh, whatever these things are. <laughs> it, oh. uh, pine siskins, I'm, uh, I'm reliably informed. They also, uh, Oh, I've got to blank the name. Why I put this in there on my balcony here, and I should have actually had a video of this because I, 
and I put down a swarm of them because there's just so many mm -hmm. and they were flying up and down and around and everywhere. And yeah. I was totally impressed. There's a little boy who walked past in the back lane here and he was absolutely mesmerized by all these birds flying around. I mean, those are eating there, those others were flying around. They've got a bird feeder up and everything. And he was absolutely mesmerized by these birds and just, just sort of bouncing up and down <laughs> watching these birds. So mm -hmm. this is just a few of them. Fabulous. Fabulous. They're just, uh, as I said, just a swarm of them, not just a flock, a swarm. <laughs> <laughs> it's fabulous. Thank you for sending in the photos in there. Yeah. And last of all, Sid, uh, you have the last hurrah. Tell us about, uh, about your photo. Well, I just say, yeah, when I heard that there was people sending in their wildlife sightings, I just sent you this one just uh, before the, the meeting. Uh, this was last, uh, about a week ago, I was just in to town. I live in a little suburban area outside of Whitehorse and uh, had an appointment, I went into town and on my way back, this northern hawk owl was right beside the Alaska Highway on a little tree. So mm -hmm. I stopped and jumped out of the car and snapped his picture. Wow. And uh, he was staring straight at me. I, I could put another picture. There was another one. He was being harassed by this very nasty raven, you know, as ravens would like their, you know, crows or anything. When they see an owl, they just go crazy. So, but he looked straight up at it and uh, you could hardly see his head, but you could see his breath coming out uh, against the dark trees there. It was quite something. But anyways, you don't often see these there. I'm pretty sure they're always around in the woods, but uh, mm. it's always nice to That's see them right open like that. Fabulous, fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, that's the end of the photos we have for uh, for this session. But um, uh, help us out. Uh, any wildlife sightings uh, like we used to do in the old uh, in the old physical uh, monthly meetings? Uh, write them down on the whiteboard. Uh, please send them in to berkmountainnats at gmail uh, We'll pick them up and uh, we'll. Uh, have a look and include them into uh, next month's uh, meeting. And uh, you can have your second, your 15 seconds of fame. And uh, yeah, that pl please, uh, if you could uh, leave it uh, uh, to two days before um, as, as the cutoff, send them any time in the next month, but uh, not within two days of the meeting. Uh, it gives me a bit of time to put them together. So, okay. Thank you, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, let's get back to the meeting. And uh, yes, back to you, uh, Ian. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if there's anybody else out there with uh, wildlife sightings to share from the last month. Anybody want to share any sighting? No, all right. Oh, I think Diane, Ooh, Diane, Vanessa. you want to have well, I, I could have said, I saw my first Robin about 10 days ago. So I, I could have sent a picture in, but I didn't. But I thought, oh, there's a Robin. So I, I did take a picture of him. <laughs> so right in, right in uh, Port Moody. So not very natural, but uh, I was quite excited. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Diane. And send us a photo next time. Um, sorry, I had a just uh, I was walking down the end of my street and the, I heard, of course, you always hear them before you see them, the, the hummingbirds and they were zooming around and buzzing each other up in the trees. And while I was watching the hummingbirds in the sky behind it was a bald eagle. So I had the tiniest and the largest right <laughs> in the same spot. <laughs> so. Very nice. Uh, Cleon? I had a bobcat run across the road coming down from Seymour after snowshoeing the other night. Oh. Good. Fabulous. Certainly being spotted more more recently and cougars as well. Yeah. Anybody else want to speak up? Okay. Uh, I'll uh, just let you know about uh, something we're going to have um, sort of between our, our, our regular monthly meetings. We're going to call it um, uh, show and shares. to 9 p.m. and our first show will be with uh, Jeff Rudd uh, showing some photos and, and talking about the Coquitlam River so living along the Coquitlam River 
So you, you can uh, check that out on our website, but also we'll be sending that out to the membership like we send out for, for these meetings, just a reminder on, on that day. So hopefully you'll be able to join us. It'll be, it'll be a little bit um, more laid back than what these meetings are, where you'll be, have time to discuss um, as the photos are being shown. And Ian, just to confirm, that's February 24 at uh, between seven and eight, right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And I'll now turn it over to Victoria. Well, I just looked at my clock and uh, you know, the saying time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> We've uh, <laughs> gone over a little bit, but um, I wouldn't have wanted to miss one word of this meeting. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so very, very much, Sid, for a fabulous talk. Thank you to the BMN members who helped run this meeting. And thank you to all of you. I hope you enjoyed it even just half as much as I did. And we'll uh, see you on the 24th, and if not, then at our um, March meeting. So I'll say good night. Thanks again. Bye bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Seth. Okay. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye, Sigrid. And if